let's take the opportunity now to discuss Islam and the Islamic philosophy represented from the sacred text of Islam called the Quran. The Quran was, according to Islamic tradition and religion, a form of divine revelation to a man named Muhammad, who is referred to as a prophet, the prophet, or the messenger. It is a strongly monotheistic religion. And as we had discussed previously, when the European world was mired in a dark age, the Islamic world was advancing optics, medicine, uh, and conserving as well as elaborating on Greek culture and philosophy. This is what is referred to as the Golden Age of Islam. The word Quran literally means reading or reciting, and the word Islam means peace through submission to God. That so long as uh, people are in, or humanity is in rebellion against God, it is not a situation of peace. That same idea is shared by Christianity. The word Islam is related to the Hebrew Shalom, which means peace as well, and is used as a greeting and a word of parting. Um, as well as in the traditional Arabic greeting, Asalam Alaikum, to which the reply is Alaikum Asalam, peace be unto you, and peace to you as well. The five pillars of Islam are the Shahada, the professing of God, the Arabic word for God is just Allah and the Prophet Muhammad. As in the phrase, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. The God of Islam and the Quran is the God of Abraham. Muslims worship the God of Abraham, as do Jews. Um, which would be uh, God the Father in Christianity. It's all one God. All three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, worship the same God. The only difference is the interpretation of the status of Jesus. For Jews and Muslims, Jesus is not considered to be uh, a messiah and is not identical with God himself. From the point of view of Islam, to turn something other than God into God is idolatry or blasphemy, uh, heresy. It's a, a, like a graven image. For both Judaism and Islam, when the first of the Ten Commandments given to the original followers of Abrahamic religion says, you shall have no other gods before thy God, from Judaism and Islam's point of view, to turn Jesus into God is a sin. That's just a difference of opinion, but I guess it's an important sticking point. To set up Jesus as an idol to worship, from the point of view of Judaism and Islam, is idolatry. From those non-Christian Abrahamic religions point of view, Christianity is not even monotheistic. It's polytheistic. It worships three gods. So, 
the statement of the Shahada is a direct response against what Islam sees as a flaw in Christian religious philosophy. The Salat is five times daily prayer facing Mecca. Zakat means charity. Ramadan is the month of fasting from sunrise to sunset. This is a type of ascetic practice similar to uh, Catholic fasting in the 40 days of Lent leading up to Easter. The Hajj is the pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina that uh, faithful Muslims, if they're able, are encouraged to undertake, if possible, at least once in their life. This is an Islamic text, uh, a medical text, uh, diagramming the structure of the human eye. Through Islamic study of optics, the later Renaissance Western world is benefited without Islamic understanding of how a lens works. Galileo doesn't get a, a telescope or Copernicus uh, and Watson and Crick don't get microscopes. So that there is an indebtedness to uh, Islamic culture and scientific advancement. If you're interested in looking in even more depth at Islamic philosophy, you might investigate the Ar Rashid House of Wisdom or the writings of Al Farabi, who attempts to integrate classical political philosophy with contemporary Islamic government in a very similar way that Renaissance Christian authors will do, as well as medieval ones, combining their chosen religion with the ancient Greeks. I believe it is worthwhile for us in the 21st century to understand the division between Sunni and Shia in Islam. Sunnis make up between 80 and 90 percent of all Muslims with majority populations in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Indonesia. They consider the merchant Abu Bakr to be the first caliph, something like a pope, and the true successor to the Prophet Muhammad. Shias are between 10 and 20 percent of all Muslims, with majority populations in Iraq, Iran, and Syria. You might notice the disastrous circumstances both Iraq and Syria have found themselves in recently. All three of them, Iran included, are what we might call international pariahs. They're outliers, um, isolated groups. And as uh, isolated and significantly oppressed religious minorities, this causes all sorts of difficulties for those populations, especially in the context of Islam more broadly, as well as in the context of the global community. They consider the Prophet Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, Ali, to be the true successor to the Prophet Muhammad and the first Imam, or a religious teacher. 
the origin of this schism or split between religious denominations within Islam has to do with a squabble which turns into a blood feud over successorship to the Prophet. There's an election after the death of the Prophet in which Abu Bakr is elected, but a minority of the fledgling Muslim community desires instead for the successorship and leadership of Islam to pass along hereditary lines to members of the Prophet's family. Before long, these two uh, conflicting parties get into hot water with each other and there ends up being an assassination in which the Prophet Muhammad's grandson, the son of Ali, whose name is also Ali, ends up being killed. This is considered to be a great sin in Islam to harm or kill a member of the Prophet's family. And so this sort of tit-for-tat violence or a blood feud uh, stretches on even until today. Let's take this opportunity now to turn to the text of the Quran explicitly. In order to attempt to make the determination if Islam is either particularly violent in its political or military philosophy or if it's any more violent than any other religion, especially Abrahamic religion. Most broadly, does Islam advocate or has, as some have put it, require terrorism? Let's note now, before we turn to the text itself, that the majority of the victims of terrorism in the Middle Eastern world are other Muslims. When you do the math about both the number of people of the Islamic faith who have engaged in terrorism or the number fighting for groups like ISIS the percentage comes up to something like 0.001% of the billion Muslims on the planet. To make the claim that uh, all Muslims are terrorists suffers from the hasty generalization logical fallacy. It's stereotyping, plain and simple, a simple prejudice, illogical and therefore immoral to make such a claim. What we'll also notice is that the history we're going to be discussing of the Western world includes nearly 500 years of military campaigns by Christians towards the other two Abrahamic religions to gain control of the Holy Land called the Crusades as well as nearly a thousand years of Inquisition in which countless numbers of human persons were tortured and killed at the hands of official Christendom. I do not think it's inappropriate to reference the Christian scriptures 
which say that one should take the plank out of your own eye before you try and remove the speck from that of your brothers. Judaism, uh, in the text of the Old Testament, is extraordinarily violent. Christianity, for the last 2,000 years of history, maybe 1,500 is a little bit more fair, is used regularly and often for violent purposes. It's uh, enmeshed with militarism. And so, if we're going to discuss the relationship between Islamic philosophy and violence, perhaps the question is more broadly about Abrahamic religion. But that's in danger of stepping on some toes. But in the spirit of Socrates, that's precisely the prick of consciousness, or of our conscience, that's almost certainly required. As we look through the text of the Quran, we'll find a number of uh, insights or wisdom worth considering. Among those include a number of themes of hellfire and damnation, such as in chapter 2, verse 39, which says that <clears throat> those who reject the faith shall be companions of fire. We might be tempted to say, how mean this Quran sounds, how violent. But this is nothing different than the message of Jesus, that uh, eternal torment awaits those who do not believe correctly, those who don't share the right faith. As we study the history of ideas, and that trajectory specifically, that eternal reward and or eternal damnation has progressed along in the Western world. There is a clear line of development from Zoroastrianism through Christianity and into Islam. the torturous hells of Islam have absolutely nothing whatsoever that is different from the same exact idea that exists in Christianity. When you see in the Quran uh, we uh, with a capital it's usually Allah speaking in the first person plural. From the point of view of the Quran, it was Allah, the God of Abraham, which rescues the Jews. It's Allah who sends Jesus, though the Christians misinterpret the message according to uh, the Quran. Chapter 2, verse 62. Those who believe in the Quran and follow the Jewish scriptures and the Christians and the Sabaeans, any who believe in Allah in the last day and work righteousness shall have their reward with the Lord. From the Islamic philosophical perspective represented in the Quran, we might understand or think of from the Islamic perspective Judaism is like one-third of the truth at least it worships the right God Christianity two-thirds of the truth the only mistake is about uh, how to understand Jesus and Islam 
is the full truth, the last and final revelation and testament to mankind from the God of Abraham. For this reason, for the vast majority of Islamic history, Christians and Jews were allowed to practice their religion, allowed to worship the God of Abraham in the way that the God of Abraham had been worshipped by them, according to their own traditions. These groups were asked to pay a tax called the jizya, or poll tax. Jizya in English, J-I-Z-Y-A. We can contrast this with an opposite history in Christian Europe, in which non-Christians were fiercely persecuted. Allah speaking here in the first person plural, through Muhammad, according to Islamic tradition, claiming that Moses comes from Allah, Jesus and Mary from Allah. And then in verse 90, we see, uh, miserable is the price for which they have sold their souls, in that they deny the Quran. They have drawn upon themselves wrath upon wrath, and humiliating is the punishment of those who reject faith. Again, it sounds mean. It sounds violent. But in fact, this is still nothing other than the, the same thing as the Christian version of punishment, wrath a humiliating eternal hell. What we should also recognize here is that punishment, wrath, and humiliation, according to the religious philosophy, metaphysics, politics, and ethics, represented in the Quran would be God's prerogative. It's God who punishes. God who hum humi humiliates. God who is wrathful. And if God wants to do those things, who are we to disagree? This is nothing other than both the Old Testament and New Testament God angry, jealous God of the Old Testament, God of judgment and eternal damnation in the New. However, all around the world, people want to do God's work on God's behalf. And it makes sense why. First off, if it's just for God to be enemy to those who reject faith, that establishes a principle that justness and goodness is defined by being in opposition to the infidels, which just means people without faith, people of the wrong faith. This is seen certainly in what Christians call the Old Testament. Jesus modifies it somewhat with his love your enemy. But Christian Europe conveniently forgets this more often than not. And we see it again here in Islam. The same idea is expressed in a nearby culture. Perhaps one of the other reasons why people 
want to do God's work on God's behalf is precisely because God does not. Imagine if we disbanded our police forces and decided we will just pray, all of us, I'm sure God will return to the kidnapped children. That would be naive, unrealistic. Not only throughout religious history does God ask people to do his work on his behalf, such as with the wars for control of the Holy Land or Promised Land originally. But if we don't step in, usually things are not accomplished. And so we get comfortable and complacent doing God's work. This idea is as well understood in the West as in the Middle East as well understood now as in a more ancient time. Allah is an enemy to those who reject faith? Still, no different than Christianity, for which God is the enemy of those who are the enemy of God. It's the exact same idea those without faith is a grievous punishment punishment again that should be God's prerogative but when the Inquisition was torturing people or when the Crusaders were attempting to conquer land in the Western world people were attempting to do what they thought God wanted them to do That is the epistemology worth considering here. Here's where we get things that are especially relevant. Who is more unjust than he who forbids that in places for the worship of Allah, Allah's name should not be celebrated? For them, there is nothing but disgrace in this world, and in the world to come, and exceeding torment. If I understand the Islamic philosophy presented in the Quran correctly, the creation of the nation of Israel after World War II in the uh, scriptural so-called promised lands could have been interpreted by the Islamic world as Christianity especially in league with Judaism attempting to kick Muslims out of a place that they believe God had given them from their perspective, this could be understood as the Western world attempting to upset God's plan. After all, Muslims had controlled that area for a thousand or more years by the 1940s. While it would be the case that, again, it would be God's prerogative to disgrace and torment such enemies of the divine order. As we had just discussed, there's a desire to want to do God's work on God's behalf. The next verses which we see are the ones people very often take exception to. Because uh, taken in isolation, out of context, and without the relevant uh, philosophical consideration we're attempting to give here, 
they sound like Islam uniquely advocates violence, that it's a violent religion, or that uh, Islam is terrorism. What it says in verse 190, fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight you, but do not transgress limits, for Allah loveth not transgressors. Islam has a difference in philosophy from Christianity. Christianity, according to the ethic provided by Jesus, literally says, do not fight back. That's the meaning of turn the other cheek. That's the significance or the example that Jesus sets when he allows himself to be killed. Jesus presents an ethic and politic of radical pacifism and nonviolence. An ethic which is all too often conveniently ignored. When September 11th, 2001 happened, we did not turn the other cheek. The entirety of the Crusades does not represent uh, Christian pacifism. Instead, it largely represents Christian imperialism or militarism. Islam offers a different ethic, however. Islam does allow a person to fight back. Christianity literally does not, according to the strictest reading of its ethic. Many people think that Christianity doesn't prevent one from fighting back. That you can defend your life and not be out of line in terms of Christian ethics. But in numerous locations, Jesus presents a different ethic than that. He says, whoever loses his life will gain it, and whoever saves his life will lose it. And that one must die to self. Jesus' example is that of the ascetic. Such extreme self-deprivation and self-denial that it literally goes unto death. After all, why should the Christian fear death if eternal glory awaits? Islam, much more like ancient Judaism, allows for uh, fighting, especially in self-defense. But, importantly, it also identifies in the same verse, do not transgress limits. I am not a scholar of Islam, but I don't think you have to be to realize what this means. Very likely terrorism, killing uh, women and children, enemy non-combatants, would qualify as transgressing limits. It really is that simple. Does the Quran advocate terrorism? No, specifically not. What it does allow is for fighting in self-defense. From the Islamic point of view, the creation of the nation of Israel and the wars that follow in the 20th century could be seen as a shot across the bow, are very likely, if my understanding is correct, perceived as the Western world fighting the Islamic world. In the holiest places, the place which, in their perspective, God had gifted to them for the past thousand or more years. Slay them wherever you catch them and turn them out from where they have turned you out. 
for tumult and oppression are worse than slaughter. But fight them not at the sacred mosque, unless they first fight you there. But if they fight you, slay them. Such is the reward of those who suppress faith. There are two sacred mosques in Islam. One in Mecca, and the other in Jerusalem, on the site of the original temple to the God of Abraham. It's called the Holy of Holies. The Quran allows fighting in self-defense. So long as people believe that they're fighting in self-defense, they can claim their actions are justified according to uh, scriptural Islamic ethics. Now, certainly people can uh, use, uh, elaborate, or um, overcompensate for these texts. And there's also uh, a pair of interesting concerns. One, significant illiteracy in the Middle Eastern world. So that people are duped into thinking or persuaded into believing that uh, holy war is required. Secondly, you get people who just ignore that important part of the verse. In the same way people ignore turn the other cheek. This section in context also provides us a way to understand a way out. Verse 192 if they cease, Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Fight them on until there is no more tumult or oppression, and there prevail justice and faith in Allah. But if they cease, let there be no hostility, except to those who practice oppression. This answers it, I think. It tells us how to stop the cycle of violence. Where we kill some of them, so they kill some of us. They kill some of us, so we kill some of them. And back and forth, it has the structure of a blood feud. Right there in the text of the Quran is the way to end the blood feud. To simply stop fighting. You just stop. Gandhi puts it this way, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. That's one of the great benefits of Christianity in particular, is that according to its original ethic, it's supposed to be nonviolent. This is overlooked, ignored, forgotten, because it's hard. Terrorism is the most challenging uh, ethical, political uh, difficulty in the world today. It's unbelievable to me that we don't require our high schoolers to read the Quran in order to understand the people we share this world with so that we can work from common ground towards ending unnecessary bloodshed. Likely the scriptural answer I've provided is significantly naive, unrealistic, impractical. Sometimes overwhelming force is required. The problem is, you can't bomb an idea. You can't shoot a hole in a thought with a bullet. If 
our world is to solve its most pressing ethical conundrum, terrorism. We will have to come armed with every weapon we have available, and our intellect should likely be at the forefront. We have to be able to fight in the idea space. Very likely, the only way to fight bad ideas is with good ones. And in pursuit of that, it would help us to understand the scriptures that are in play. I look forward to seeing your discussion of these issues in the discussion boards.